Welcome to the latest episode of the Papal Profiles series. This episode looks at the impact of the first pope to earn the honorific, the great, Pope Leo. Leo is key to the history of the Catholic Church for two very important reasons that this video will dive into. The first major contribution made by Leo the Great was stepping into the political vacuum left in Rome following the moving of the western capital to Milan, and from Milan to Ravenna about 40 years before Leo became Pope. When Attila came knocking at the gates of Rome in 452 and Geyseric in 455, it was Leo who negotiated with the threats on behalf of the people of Rome. Leo was lucky with Attila as his army withdrew, although historians do not know the actual reason why Attila chose to leave. This event marks the first time the Bishop of Rome took a leading political role in the welfare of the city. However, with Geyseric, Leo miscalculated badly and the city was sacked. The other major contribution to church history made by Leo were the attempts to assert Roman authority for the first time over the other bishops in Italy, and he won from the emperor an edict declaring his supremacy. Strong assertions of Roman primacy appear in his letters to the Western bishops, and Leo provides the oldest surviving assertion of Petrine privilege over other bishops in Sicily in a letter sent in 447, in which he takes it upon himself to instruct them. In another letter to Bishop Hilary of Arles, Leo used his assumed Roman privilege to intervene in Gaul and instruct Hilary about Hilary's attempts to overstep his authority and meddle in the affairs of the Diocese of Vienne. Democopolis notes that these letters are examples of the start of the expansion of Roman influence via the Petrine argument for papal authority and that they demonstrate the degree of uncertainty with which his assertions were met. In the letter to Hilary, Leo implies that his authority is ignored by the bishops who do not accept it, and as such, they are evidence that papal claims to authority reflect Leo's desires and not the reality of the church hierarchy. Leo also petitioned, and won from the Western Emperor, Valentinian III, a declaration of Roman primacy in 445, but given that the empire had split into two again, the proclamation only had legitimacy over bishops in churches in the western half. However, Leo's ambitions for supremacy suffered more international humiliations at the Council of Chalcedon in 451. First, Leo petitioned Emperor Marcion to move the council to the west and also attempted to delay its start, and both moves were denied by the emperor in a blow to Leo's sense of importance. Then, reinforcing Canon III from the Council of Constantinople, Canon 28 from Chalcedon conferred equal dignity with the Pope upon the bishopric of Constantinople as the New Rome. Leo initially refused to confirm the council because of this slight to his position, as the bishop of Constantinople gained equality via politics and not by descent from the apostles as with the bishops of Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch. Both Western and Eastern emperors wrote to Leo and urged him to confirm the council and preserve its resolutions. Finally, in March 453, Leo caved to the political pressure and wrote to the bishops to confirm the new Trinitarian formulation created at Chalcedon, but he insisted that nothing contravene Nicaea, taking a subtle shot at the impudence of Canon 28 without actually mentioning the subject. Following his setback at Chalcedon, Leo switched tactics in his subsequent letters to the East as he sought to assert his primacy as Peter's heir, setting the stage for the antagonism of East-West church relations that has continued to be the case ever since. After being humiliated at two Eastern councils, the Petrine authority argument emerges once again in his letters and is particularly present in Epistle 33, which increased the papal rhetoric by turning theological questions into an argument for submitting to the Pope's self-appointed final authority on such matters. Democopolis notes that Leo most aggressively used the Petrine argument when his authority was challenged, or only when he was in a weak position and unable to impact Eastern affairs. By late 457, Leo had given up his fight over Canon 28 and acquiesced that both sides would merely agree to disagree over the Bishop of Rome's self-appointed primacy. Regardless of the lack of historical reality in Leo's rhetoric for papal authority, as a result of his efforts and talents, Leo took great opening strides in the long process of centralizing power within the Vatican, a situation which eventually did become the reality in later eras. If you like my content, please like and subscribe to get notified of new videos. 
please also consider supporting my work by becoming a Patreon sponsor. You can also find me on the following platforms. 